Thank you, Rod, and congratulations on a successful meeting, and um, uh, thank you all for coming. It's a great privilege to join the ranks of Dr. Patchell and uh, Mendel, and obviously Dr. Adler. And I, 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 I'm not going to have his uh, boldness here, but I'm also not going to pitch any other journals. So it's about, and I'm going to disappoint you a little bit because I'm, if I get the right thing, I have no conflicts to talk about, but this talk is not about which classification system to use or which tumor marker which imaging might be better, or which device, or which screw size works better. Sorry, Emil, no 6.5 screws. Uh, for, um, for those who are interested in money, again, um, I'm also going to disappoint you, but it's not about dollars, although uh, Charles Fisher, just north of the border, has with this clustergram shown that uh, there's a direct equation between Canadian dollars and how many days you can ambulate. So there's a, uh, on the uh, x-axis is the days of ambulation, on the y-axis is the Canadian dollar expenditure. So I hope we'll not come to there that we equate every minute that we are allowed to walk to a dollar figure. And I'm also not going to talk about which graft works better, uh, better under what circumstances. That's actually wrong. I'm going to talk about it a little bit in the end. But uh, the specifics of technique, uh, I think, are just secondary to the three key pillars that I find in terms of how we approach uh, tumor disease. And number one, this is uh, our patients. I mean, they look at us, and they come to us with expectation. And it is us to bring them hope and to give them uh, clarity. Number two is resources, and again, if you're working out of an OR like this and uh, your tumor board looks something like this, that's a problem. And again, you should probably not go into oncology. This is why there are these cool centers now. And what fulfills me with a little bit of worry is that wherever I travel around the country, I see these tumor centers popping up. And again, it's, it's really cool to see if it's MD Anderson or some of those centers really concentrate uh, great uh, people on one location. And uh, obviously, this is something that's emerging here and it's fulfilled me with a lot of pride to be part of. So you want to have resources, not just technological, but also uh, infrastructurally and discipline-wise in terms of the organizational structure. So that's a very uh, key component. Um, and then finally, the third pillar is you, the doctor, us, the providers. And again, um, everybody lies is the famous line from uh, Dr. House, but we don't want to lie. This is something that's really uh, very challenging, maybe one of the most challenging entities in spine care, and that is uh, oncologic uh, care, even with the advent of uh, stereotaxics and other resources. Uh, sometimes you're just in the situation of damn if you do, damn if you don't. And uh, that's again a, a multiple uh, phrased term that you hear. And this brings me to the general theme of my talk, which is and not nuts and bolts or 6.5 versus 7.5 millimeter screws. <clears throat> It is that there is a scientific component and there's an art component to what we do. And yes, we're also asked to have a predictive power, which is very hard uh, to come by and can't be really taught. It's something that you develop as a gut and sometimes you make mistakes, sometimes you make errors, but you have to be like an Erasmus of Rotterdam, combining the art, the science, and being the great predictor of your time. You're going to be asked for that. So let me delve a little bit into the science component first. And again, you've uh, heard some of this before, but I'm just going to give you kind of a very brief uh, summary of that. I do think that on the scientific, the knowledge base side, we are really blessed with an unprecedented true knowledge base. Again, we now know how to really uh, interpret images in an unprecedented and a systematic fashion. Every resident gets taught how to look at host responses on the images, fast versus slow growing, lytic, blastic, expand cell versus contained. And again, we can see for the first time everything. Uh, we can also look at the systemic uh, effect beyond the local effect far better than ever before. And again, try to understand what, where, how our targets uh, of uh, interpretation and of intervention need to be. The stability angle is uh, through a couple of uh, major advancements really getting far better uh, in terms of what we can do. Um, again, uh, metastatic disease has been discussed before, but uh, this is clearly the primary target for all of us now. And uh, again, 10 to 20 of those, uh, percent of those patients develop neurologic compromise. The vast majority are actually a very defined um, uh, base of uh, breast, lung, kidney, prostate, thyroid, and multimyeloma disease. And again, it is us, uh, up to us to identify what they are as fast as possible and come to a conclusion. In terms of the staging, we are, I think, all, regardless of subspecialty, now finally on the same page. Uh, we use the Enneking staging in terms of benign and malignant diseases. And I think that's become just really very helpful in terms of how we categorize things. And Tomita has obviously been fantastic in terms of 
giving us a big picture gestalt of spinal metastases with this contained and uncontained on the right side categorization. And then again, multi-level diseases. And again, his suggestion in Japan was that those patients who have a certain point score above um, eight and his specific zero to 10 scale should probably not get surgical care or maybe even radio care, but maybe just palliative care. We've heard a landmark lecture in Dr. Patchell. This is again one of those true sentinel events. It's an incredible honor to have him here. And again, his famous trial, um, just giving a very a brief summary picture of that, uh, has its 10th anniversary now. It's been 10 years. So I hope we celebrated him. I had to be in the operating room during that time. But this is his 10th anniversary of this uh, landmark paper. Your pardon? We'll celebrate the 10th anniversary tonight. This is a special occasion. And he changed uh, the picture. And again, it's been dramatic. This is a graphic depiction. I don't know whether he showed that, but this is from my good friend Charles Fisher, who gave me the slide, which basically graphically displays how um, the advent of surgery has really pushed out, represented by this black graph, to the right side, to the ambulatory capability of patients with, uh, afflicted with metastatic spine disease. So it's uh, so dramatic that, as you've heard before, um, the trial had to be abandoned because the, the differences were so clear. The risk factors for collapse I addressed briefly before is, again, something that we all kind of always learned a little bit of a gestalt. We learned about 30 to 40 percent or pedicle destruction to be bad in the lumbar spine and the thoracic spine. We gave it a little bit more because of the rib cage. We said 50 percent, uh, 25 percent if the costovertebral joints were broken. That was, again, not so predictive. We now have the SINS score. Did you talk about that earlier? Did anybody talk about the SINS score? Yes. Good, so I'm not going to go through it, but you've heard. This is, again, for the first time, a truly global effort to try to categorize and uh, compartmentalize the scores. And again, the inter-observer reliabilities are um, fair, so that's probably better than what can be said about other scores. The intra-observer reliabilities are outstanding. So within each surgeon, the predictability has become very high. We still have significant cultural differences, especially between Europe and North America, which are really difficult to interpret. The score was developed over a one-year effort uh, with the tumor study group within AO Spine. So. And then again, we should know the enemy, and uh, we should know that the vast majority of diseases that affect the vertebral body are malignant. Um, we should know that the vast majority of pediatric lesions are benign. And we should know where what tumor diseases lie. And again, these are very basic things, but we've come a long way in our knowledge base to predict disease and understand its biologic behaviors. In our tools, again, on the left column, we have uh, the non-interventional radiotherapies. On the right side, uh, we have uh, chemotherapy and uh, uh, vertebroplasties. And again, the chemotherapy has come a long ways in itself. In the center, we have surgery. And again, this talk is about surgery. So uh, we have to realize that we're not in a vacuum. The surgical field lies between these other modalities. And one should not forget the top left um, entity, and that represents um, palliative care. Palliative care is a very important part, and we as surgeons should know how to use that and implement that just as much as our surgery or um, the other modalities like SRS. So with this kind of a very brief uh, overview of the knowledge base, where does that leave the surgeon and the patient as a columns? And one of the key questions that we've never fully understood um, uh, really is what do our patients actually want and what can they tolerate reasonably? Mm -hmm. This is something that's really puzzled me quite a bit because we really should ask them more. And, uh, frequently we try to probably ask them, we make a bona fide effort, I would grant, but uh, I'm not sure that the message that we're trying to convey and the expectations of the patients actually match that well. One other question is, um, we should tell them what we know, obviously, but we also should ask them what they want, and that's a very clear answer. And we should probably also score our patients. That's something that we've really not done systematically well enough. The general surgery literature has the Karnofsky performance status, which is a 0 to 100 score, which is actually a very reasonable score in terms of assessing metastatic disease. Do you use that at MD Anderson, the Karnofsky? Pretty routine in any spine met. So that's something that I think um, anybody who does uh, care for metastatic patients should probably use as one of the reasonably validated uh, classics in terms of trying to just scale our patients. And below a certain level, if you hit a 10 or a 20, you should probably not have major surgeries. You should probably not even be uh, 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 selected for radiotherapy. 
One very simple way for all of us to categorize patients has been really overlooked, I think, in spine care. And uh, I want to make a plug from my former residency mate who just recently passed away, George Cerny, who validated this uh, uh, ABC category for host factors for total joints. And it's a very well-accepted score that for some reason has never been extrapolated for other patient entities. And for me, as a simple clinical triaging factor, this is a very helpful score. A normal patient has normal systemic, vascular, metabolic, and healthy factors. A compromised patient has local disease and cigarettes, for instance, or a very local disease. And a C patient is depressed, has systemic disease uh, other than the neoplasia, obviously nutritionally, metabolically uh, disease. So those are obviously the very simple factors. There's a little bit more selectiveness in them, but the basic triaging is very effective in terms of predicting outcomes from orthopedic uh, reconstructive procedures. I'm pretty sure it would translate one-on-one -on -one to the spine care as well. So finding the right balance of invasiveness is very important because this picture on the left-hand side came from a patient uh, who came to me who had been radiated and had surgery and basically had the spine literally herniate to the back wound. This patient had gone for about a year with wound care and there's no way that this patient was helped. The tumor was killed by the radiation, but quite clearly this patient actually eventually perished from this uh, radiation spine disaster. So finding the right balance of invasiveness is an art and a very difficult thing. You've all heard about the complexity of radiation relative to surgery, and again, Gogavala has really re very well shown um, this, and again, uh, 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 Dr. Mendel talked about that earlier also. We do need to be very cognizant because there's a very clearly raised infection and wound complication rate in the conjunction with radiation. So this is where I wanna go into a real life case this is a 54-year-old male. He had severe low back pain for two weeks. He was a, a retired armed forces member and had been retired for about five years. And he'd been unable to walk for about six hours. Does this show up on your screens or not so well? Yeah. Hard? Dr. Paulson, do you want to venture? I'm going to pick on you here because he's a back right benchler. Uh, what you see on that screen? So, as these slides, uh, slide points identify, this man is a heavy smoker. He used to drink a lot. He has no known other health problems. I mean, he served our country with pride until about five years earlier. He's not walked for about six hours. What would you like to do? How aggressively would you like to proceed? Is this the only we have? You'll get a little bit more. I mean, there's a, can this checklist help? Is there anything on this checklist that you would not want? Like what? Take away. Don't need a bone scan. Okay. Yes. Eliminate. Great. Uh, I'll take the labs. You'll take labs? Good. Do you want a PET scan? Don't need a PET scan. Okay. So I'll get a couple of things. Dr. Adler, did I forget anything? You can't even see the image. My eyes have old eyes. So we're getting uh, some more MRI images here. Yeah, sorry, they, they don't project as well. I'm, I apologize. Yeah. So any new insights here, uh, Dave? I'll give you some CTs also. It's about T10. What about that middle MRI, that sagittal uh, T1 weighted image? So I'm trying to find the button with that bright. 
just severe cord compression. There's a canal invasion. It's about 70% canal invasion. And then this lesion has also grown into the paraspinal muscles here. So it's uh, gone invasive uh, into the, was left the compartment, in other words. To six hours of cord compression or of neurologic symptoms. So the question, exactly. So the question is, how much do you want to do? Um, this guy obviously has a cord problem. You have no idea what this is. You're getting a body scan. I'll give you the results of the body scan in a second. But so he had a brain scan, was clear. Um, this is just a quick little uh, lab and uh, study rundown. So he had a brain imaging that was normal. Neural axis MRI outside of this one area shows no other lesions. So this is an isolated T10 lesion. He has lytic liver um, uh, masses, which nobody knows what they are. Um, and again, several things just per year request weren't done. The general labs showed high LFTs, low platelets. The patient is coagulopathic, he has like 60,000 platelets. So you have a time bomb ticking again. This is a right. vulnerable cord area, T10. So, so I don't suspect this is going to be a, a primary bone lesion, so, but I do think this is probably a metastatic lesion. Yeah. And that um, his neurologic function needs to be preserved. So try to, you know, he needs to be decompressed at least. So what's unusual about this primary location, if I go back, um, for this being a that, metastatic lesion? Yeah, that it's, that's more uh, the posterior elements. Yeah, exactly. So what we just said is a basic rule. Um, it's not so good. What can we tell about the biology of this tumor, the biologic behavior? It's aggressive. It's very aggressive. There's no host response. It's basically just invading the host across all anatomic boundaries, right? Yes, sir. So um, this is the situation now. So we have a coagulopathic patient. We don't know what the primary is. What is the concern in terms of a primary? What could be lurking there, Ryan? You mean as far as the Why wouldn't you just take this patient to the operating room right away? Um, the, the low platelets and coagulopathy would be my most concerning part. I mean, this is something that could end up being a pretty bloody surgery. So that alone, yes. And then the primary, there are a couple of notoriously blood like which ones? I mean, like renal cell. Thyroid, renal cell, those are the classics. Melanoma. Yeah, melanoma I mean, can bleed also. He's a, if he's a veteran, there's a better than average chance elderly veteran that he's been out in the sun for quite a while could have some melanoma-like lesion that was never really been picked up. So the question now is we have, again, a patient who is coagulopathic. We could correct that, but we don't know what the primary is. Do we want to get a biopsy? Who in this room would want to get a biopsy? Dr. Adler, would you want to get a biopsy? I can't even see it. Okay. <laughs> Th those radiation doses have just... I think I would want to get a biopsy. You'd want to get a biopsy? How long are you going to wait for the biopsy? Uh, what are you going to look for in the biopsy, I should rather ask? I guess it would just... It would help me determine whether you know, treatment, again, if I had a better diagnosis. If I had a better diagnosis, I think I would have a better treatment plan. So first of all, what can a pathologist give you within an hour or a day that is meaningful? Have you, have you heard, uh, seen the same problem that I have over the last couple of years, which is that most pathology diagnoses take not a day, but we're talking about a week or weeks, plural. Is that? Yes. But I fully agree with you. Um, but again, I, I don't think that's, I don't want to fall into the three W's that we learned about earlier in the day. Um, and, and again, there's a lot of red flags in this. And I think, again, I would just be more cautious than aggressive. At the cost of possibly losing his cord. I mean, he literally changed from a walking man uh, that morning uh, he came in in the afternoon. He didn't walk anymore. He had a true Asia C motor status, roughly about 60, probably. Yeah. He couldn't yeah. pee anymore. He had to have a Foley. Yeah. I, I, now, having said that, I'm not in the ER right now because my if I was in the ER, I would probably err on the side of going to surgery. Mm -hmm. But when you sit back and think about it, you, you still had time to do, you know, labs, CTs, MRIs, you had time to do all those other things. Another hour or so for a needle biopsy probably isn't going to 
change things. Fair enough, but just the it's interpretation. Right, the lymphoma, and they, the pathologist Great can't point. say it's, a, you know, it's a vascular type of, you know, blood For pathology. sure. Yeah. And we saw one of the three W's, radiosensitive, made that whole tumor mm -hmm. melt away. Yeah. And uh, surgery was a big, uh, oh, man, you messed up big time. Emil. But even if it's a lymphoma, so he's six, six hours out. There's no steroids that's going to decompress him in that amount of time. You know, it's, I, I mean, even if you get a biopsy and it's a lymphoma, he's got a, he's got a full compressed cord. You know, I got a, I got an error on the side of, uh, of decompressing the cord. That's All I can say is, and you probably have this from trauma as well, is when people come in anticoagulated, that's a really big problem. And I have definitely seen people go from normal coagulopathy to coagulopathic, and you just can't stop it. So you know, having the experience of seeing coagulopathies go downhill, uh, this frightens me. And, and most anesthesiologists with a platelet count of 60,000, they won't open the doors for you. They don't care. That's been my all, experience. These are all great points. Claudia, what do you think? I think that this guy has metastatic disease. I don't think this is a primary tumor. I think that I would get a CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Most tumors come from those locations, except thyroid that, that, and melanoma, right? Uh, it's coagulopathy. I mean, I, I, I agree with the concern of bleeding. This can bleed to death. If this is a renal cell carcinoma, metastasis is going to bleed like crazy. If this is liver cancer, metastatic to the spine is going to bleed like crazy. Uh, it's, we're in a very hard position because the guy lost function. So if you think that, I'm not thinking that this is a primary tumor. I'm thinking as, can we restore his function or not? But then on the same time, you think, is he going to survive surgery? So I'll definitely, I'll try to get him work up, uh, you know, see if there is anything that we can correct. Uh, on the very end, is the decision is going to be do a more economic surgery just to decompress his cord, see how he tolerates, and eventually uh, do the rest of the surgery after we, get, we stabilize him better or not do anything and just give uh, steroids and radiation. So I would, s that, that, that's the, basically the two managements that I can see for this situation. Stero uh, sorry, steroids, high dose steroids, or just conventional radiation, because you, his surgical risk is too high, or try to do a more economic surgery to decompress the cord, simple laminectomy, as under patient will understand that it's not gonna be, it's the best you can do right now. That, that'll be how I would manage this case. How long? Just an honest answer. Uh, we're not bragging. Any, nobody's bragging here. How long does it take you to get a needle biopsy to get a reading back from the pathologist? And what are the most meaningful things that you can glance on, let's say, a one or two hour brief first HE stain? I think it's going to take... Uh, you, you, you know, another thought would be trying to get a pathologist in there, do a needle biopsy first, send a frozen, tell me what it is. Is it a lymphoma or not? That's the only information I want to know. If, it's, if he tells me it's a lymphoma, then I would abort surgery and I would do just radiation and steroids. If he tells me it's, it's a carcinoma, then I think I have to decompress it because there is no other option here. Since I took him to an operation. And uh, I, in Anderson, I can get a pathologist to, to tell me if it's carcinoma or not. Uh, probably have to require a phone call, talk to him, maybe bribe him a little bit. But I think <laughs> we can get it. <laughs> Uh, if, it's, if it's during regular hours in a weekday, I think I can get it easily. But if it's on a weekend or middle of the night, that's kind of become a problem. Middle of the night is really a problem. If this is like two, 3 o'clock in the morning, I would postpone until the morning. Because, uh, you know, going in there 3 o'clock in the night uh, with 60,000 plates and have a bloodbath, I think it might be better just to go at 7 o'clock in the morning and with better uh, structure to do the case. So it's... There is no right or wrong on here on, on this case. I would uh, try, if I want to preserve uh, function, I think six hours is still you have a therapeutic window where you can recover uh, some function here. So I would pursue that. If it's like 24 hours or 48 hours, I wouldn't even uh, consider it. Then I would do just an elective biopsy and then uh, just to figure out what it is. John, what do you think? The tumor that you can't see, I know, but assuming that there's a lesion, how fast would you biopsy? What do you look for? Is I, that a de unnecessary delay? Do you want to just with, land with no diagnosis at all? I would like to try to biopsy this. I mean, I understand why you want to run off to the operating room, um, but you uh, 
you, you owe it to the give this guy. I think you owe it to yourself to give this a, kind of a couple of hours to intelligently manage this. If you do stick a needle and if it doesn't stop bleeding, you know it's a renal cell or a thyroid tumor or something too. I mean, there is some. I mean, even without the, having a histology, you'll learn something with sticking a needle into it. And and then, God forbid, why can't you just stick a needle in yourself if you're if it's over the weekend or you know you can. Go down to the CT scanner, and there's still simple ways to stick a needle in this as a trained surgeon. So um, I, I'm, you know, I've seen enough disasters. Look, I'm not as clear the spine surgeon you guys are, but I've seen enough spine disasters in my life where people wandered into tumors that they didn't know what they were wandering into. And uh, and if it is one of those, then I think you'd like to know in advance. And there's some more intelligent ways to manage it. And I think you owe you uh, to give yourself a couple of hours to more intelligently approach this surgically, I think, is, is time well spent. And if uh, by some chance they really respond well to steroids, well, then you also have an answer there, too. So I would go for a biopsy. Biopsy. And again, the only thing you want to rule out, we have a consensus there. I'm seeing emerging no lymphoma, right? No lymphoma. Although I yeah. suspect lymphoma might even respond very briskly to steroids, too. If you're going to push some big blasts of steroids, yeah, you'll know in a couple hours. So he did get steroids when he came in the door. He, he got steroids literally right away, and then he went through all this testing. And he stabilized, but he did not improve his neurologic exam. What about embolization? Should we embolize right now? Could that tell us something? Yeah. So we did, so he had a uh, Asia C status, bladder was out, weak anal sphincter tone, he had perianal sensation attack. So he had that uh, sacral preservation. Uh, so the biopsy question, the group uh, said we should uh, get a biopsy. And again, uh, let's just uh, go through the conceptual approach of what we just talked about. So patient health is a big factor. We have a tumor that insults it, and the treatment can uh, cause an insult also. The third trifecta is obviously the patient outcome, what the patient wants and what we want. And this is where I want to just uh, compare oncology and spine oncology to kind of an art. Because yes, it's a science, and yes, we're all trained to be scientists. But uh, interpreting the literature is an art. Interpreting the imaging has some artistry to it, as long as you can see the image. And interpreting what the patient says is a translational act that can be quite difficult. Not just from a language skill, but in terms of what patients uh, enunciate as they're in some extremis. Because they've, like this man that I just showed you, not planned for this. Like an artist, uh, you have a choice of what medium will you choose. Uh, whether it's your paint, uh, a chisel, pottery, or airbrush, what style will you choose? Will you be a calm, sedate uh, impressionist, or will you be a graphic expressionist and uh, be very dramatic? How much detail will you do? Will it be an abstractionist or will you be a hyper-realist in terms of how much uh, you want to achieve? And how radical or conservative are you going to be in terms of your surgical approach? So these are, uh, I think, truly um, uh, corollaries which uh, fit very much to the oncologic decision-making that uh, one has to do. And they go way beyond the artistry of the operating room and putting your screws in parallel. You obviously want to scout your enemy, and we've discussed the conundrum of uh, the biopsy. And again, we have to try to understand the tumor personality. In the first couple of hours, and then as you're thinking about surgery, vascularity is one of the preeminent things. And that's something that oncologists uh, really have not paid that much attention to for the longest time until more recently. Uh, radiologists, in terms of the imaging studies, have also not uh, looked at it too much. The tumor permeability and treatment responsiveness to, for instance, radiation has also not been really looked uh, at that well. So the tumor biology and behavior is something that we really want to go through a checklist with. And again, physiologic imaging is great, uh, such as this high-intensity uh, chondrosarcoma with a dead uh, center. But this is, again, something that takes more time in an urgency situation, which is the other factor in oncologic care. This is a really big deal. So obviously every lesion, and I'm not going to read through that, all of you know this, uh, has certain weaknesses. And again, radiotherapy um, has a very clear, uh, very important role, certainly for uh, the uh, small cell diseases, myeloma, lymphoma, et cetera. And again, there are obviously other actions that we can take if we and when we understand what kind of lesions uh, the patient has. So the treatment uh, and the treatment impact has to be considered, obviously. Radiation, chemotherapy, embolization surgery, and palliation. Now about the surgical um, efficiency. 
Again, uh, we all know that a pure laminectomy and steroids, although Claudio just uh, said we should consider it as a, an initial palliative procedure in this particular patient because he has pretty good residual bone structure, um, had really not shown a great effect uh, compared to radiation therapy. Uh, so I'm going to ask John later about this patient, whether he should just be radiated uh, after getting a biopsy. Uh, so this was historic. Uh, now we, again, very much know that the vast majority of patients, excluding the patient I just showed you, have anterior compression. Few have lateral or posterior compression, like what this patient had, mainly. However, we also do know, and this is a classic landmark article from the Harrington of Harrington Rod fame, uh, that, and he was a Texan from Houston, I believe, um, uh, that uh, there was a clear role for instrumentation. This is, again, a 1988 article. So this is a very recent discovery, really, 30 years ago. Uh, that basically uh, anterior decompression stabilization should be performed. In terms of vertebral augmentation, this is something that's clearly in our armamentarium. And again, there, the general literature review for selected uh, tumors is very encouraging in terms of really improving function and improving pain. And the best article for that is for, probably from Daryl Fernie. Uh, they're not large cohorts, and of course, they could be very readily um, re produced in other centers, in multi-center studies, for instance. But basically, in his uh, landmark study, he did show very clearly that kyphoplasty in these select lesions led to a very significant improvement. And this was how vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty came about in the first uh, uh, role, and we have kind of forgotten it. In terms of uh, surgical roles, again, we don't have that many great papers about this. And this is, again, a group through AO Spine that we put together to try to, uh, um, obviously, look at everything, and there's just one article that towers over everything. I'm not going to go through it again, but Dr. Patchell's article, clearly in terms of methodological clarity, the parameters uh, used uh, was just uh, head and shoulders above anybody else. Another landmark article that clearly showed uh, what to do in terms of primary care, uh, sorry, primary lesions, uh, was that of the Gokazan group uh, from uh, Johns Hopkins, where uh, together with the SEER, the SER database, it was very clearly shown that on block resections for chordoma and sarcoma variants had a much better uh, long, long term outlook than just uh, more or less in situ or interlesional excisions. Obviously, there's a very key, uh, clear uh, path that comes out of that. If you do on block resections, it's a very long procedure, it's a very radical procedure, and you and your surgical reconstructions will need to uh, really uh, do a far more comprehensive reconstruction uh, following that. So the treatment algorithms that this group basically uh, came up with were the following. Of course, even in a uh, rush, try to get a diagnosis as good as, good as possible. Number two, again, Dr. Adler will be happy to see this, radiate and brace uh, sensitive lesions. The mechanical instability factor is still something that we should probably discuss at some point in time in terms of when, where, what are the stability criteria or the SINs criteria helpful in terms of making our decision for um, radiation alone without a bracing. Uh, from purely empirical um, uh, standpoints, I've seen that a lot of oncologic patients don't like braces. They're grateful for them in the beginning, and then after a while, get really tired of them. The oncologists don't like them at all. And then, of course, uh, the surgical um, uh, practice, anterior cage uh, with methyl Thacrylate, probably rigid fixation for palliative metastatic disease, a staged posterior and then anterior resection for primary lesions with a goal of a very radical, not being truly radical excision, and cost of transvasectomy versus transpedicular resections for thoracic lesions uh, for metastatic diseases. That's the basic recommendation of this group. Uh, most cases, again, benefit from a rigid posterior fixation. You want to perform surgery before radiation, if at all possible. Operate while neurologically intact is another very eminent uh, uh, recommendation. Operate before fractures occur, and most cases don't require fusion because of longevity. The one nuts and bolts recommendation that everybody knows now is the two above, two below paradigm. So you want to have two healthy vertebra above and below. We try to not do these elaboramas uh, in metastatic disease and uh, uh, resections of chordomas and sarcomas. It frequently takes more than that. This is a case example of uh, renal cell cancer where we again went all out. This 52-year-old patient, she had been uh, resected like five years earlier. She was just devastated when she was diagnosed with a uh, renal cell metastasis. It was a biopsy proven. It was a destructive lesion that had replaced probably about three-quarters of a vertebral body. Uh, she had had radiation therapy, unfortunately, 
um, before uh, we saw her. She had severe pain. She had some host response, as you can see here, so it was not just all doomsday, and she was neurologically intact. After a lengthy discussion with her, and obviously after a complete mapping, this is an MRI. Uh, these uh, show a little bit better. And uh, obviously, full-scale evaluation, we decided to embolize her, and we went all out. We did a posterior and then anterior um, block resection. So a posterior, more or less amputation of the posterior elements down to the pedicle, did bilateral discectomies on both sides, and then released the vertebral body as a whole from the front, uh, basically as a package deal once the vessels were out of way. We used an allograft here. This is an argumentable point uh, because it uh, presumably gives us a better visualization if there's a recurrence. Uh, what do you think in terms of, Claudia, about a uh, choice of an allograft in a patient where you want to monitor for long-term uh, uh, tumor recurrence versus a titanium cage where you have this flare? I really, I don't think these patients will fuse, especially if they're going to give radiation, if you're going to get radiation after. If you're doing an M-block resection, that's probably the definitive treatment, right? So you're eradicating the disease, and then uh, I think you need to, to try a fusion. Uh, for metastatic disease, we just put allograft. We have a DBX or an osteocell that we, we use. We don't uh, use BMP. If this is a, an, if you are considering uh, doing a, this resection of renal cell and have achieve a fusion, the best bet is the vascularized graft. And uh, in the thoracic spine, what we do for cordomas is to try to get a vascularized rib graft in there, back in there. But that requires plastic surgery and thoracic surgery to harvest the graft, and it's a difficult graft to harvest. Uh, I, for metastasis, metastatic disease, we all do, uh, we, we, we trust on the hardware, so I think two above, two below at least, and uh, we try to always reconstruct the anterior column, and that seems to be a durable reconstruction. We, the failure rates uh, with metacrylate uh, is very low. We did a study we're about to publish uh, apparently uh, 400 reconstructions, 5% uh, or 3% sorry, 3% of failures of the cement block. Could, could you give us uh, uh, the numbers on five year survival for renal cell carcinoma and then treatment for recurrent renal cell? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, we did a we published uh, in Journal of Neurosurgery Spine a year ago 256 renal cell carcinomas we treat in MD Anderson. Okay. Those, the median survival was, uh, if I'm not wrong, 11.9 months. Okay, that's the overall. However, when we looked on patients that, I, I, I did the revision and I said, no, there's something here. Something, some groups, some patients are dying like dogs in three months and some others are surviving like two, three years. So uh, when we, was after brainstorming a lot, we looked on the, the status of the systemic disease is the key factor. If someone is progressing on the disease, meaning that, and our criteria was a lung lesion that was increasing in two consecutive studies before the surgery, uh, this guy's survival was four months. If there was nothing progressing or is something that was diagnosed concurrent, like a kidney cancer and a met on the spine, those guys survived 18 to 24 months. And we had four, uh, 44, this is interesting, we have 44 patients with single solitary metastasis. They had an nephrectomy done, and they had just a solitary tumor on T4, like this. And because this is the case where you would consider an M-block resection, right? So these guys, these 44, nobody got an M-block resection. We all did intralesional resections. And uh, local recurrence was, nobody recurred in the follow-up. But 75% of those guys develop another metastasis somewhere in less than 12 months. So the argument that you're eradicating the disease, no, it's not. So is it valuable? Probably yes. I, I, I think that when you had just conventional radiation and no targeted therapies, that's probably was the best bet. But nowadays with stereotactic radiation and targeted therapies, maybe intralesional resection, less demanding surgery might be better for those patients. That's a great discussion. Um, again, my question before was also aimed at uh, choosing the graft relative to you wanting to have a sensitive neuro imaging afterwards. Do you make a differentiation in terms of graft use uh, from that aspect? No. No. All right. So this is, this is a, again, a principle of going posterior anterior. Uh, again, this is almost the same numbers that you just quoted. So if we looked at uh, uh, one of the major studies in terms of complications, um, these have not been improved on by our uh, recent AO study. Mean survival, 16 months, 25% major complication rate. 
And again, patients who have a significant neurodeficit, so if they're Asia A, meaning they're completely paralyzed, have no motor or sensory function, or B, just sensory preservation, they have much increased uh, complications. Preoperative radiation patients we've talked about that several times. Uh, interestingly, the tumor type did not have any significant differences in terms of complications. So this was not a factor. So now the real life case, again, we have a tumor that very suddenly hit a patient. We have a treatment option. The group has decided they want to basically um, uh, do a, a needle biopsy and wait for a pathologist to render an opinion. Uh, in talking to the patient, he basically said, I don't want to live if I am paralyzed. So um, he had been out for basically six hours um, and uh, he obviously had significant um, uh, problems. Um, we basically did an embolization, three above, three below. It was a vascular lesion. Um, our pathologist uh, was there. We actually did what you said. We had a pathologist come into the room. And uh, they felt comfortable with one thing only, and that was it was not a lymphoma. That was the only thing they wanted to say. They said it's likely a carcinoma. So we basically proceeded with open surgery um, through the same tract. And it was, again, amazing. I mean, uh, having had about uh, four hours of tanking up with FFPs, uh, we lost actually very little blood. Um, the diagnosis this is, again, typical nowadays, took two hours. It was a metastatic liver CA. So in retrospect, those uh, liver lesions were predictive. He made an amazing recovery, and he's actually doing very well. We followed here in the two above, two below rule. We did a full bilateral costal transosectomy, resected one root on either side and was an actually very controlled um, uh, tumor resection. We didn't do a full on block, but we did a semi on block with an osteotome so we could lift out the lesion. Now, I'm gonna uh, present it to you. This on a stability criteria, if we look at it from a SINS perspective, is uh, not fully in there because it has neurology, but basically from a mechanical standpoint, uh, this is a pretty stable uh, spine. So did we overreact? Did I overreact by putting this corpectomy in? What do you all think? Did I overreact? Misha? Why? I mean, he had three quarters of the body were still alive. No, but, uh, you know, uh, yeah, but, you know, like, you know, John, you criticized us before about not thinking enough about uh, SRS. So, incomplete patient. No, I mean, I, this is a perfect case in point where a significant myelopathy from a mechanical you know, problem needs a mechanical solution. And surgery is, I mean, the, <clears throat> the only thing I was calling out the question was, do you have an hour or two to kind of screw around with and do the most intelligent operation possible? I guess, you know, I, I, angiography is a way, I guess, to... I was unaware of it to sort of get around the biopsy. So obviously worked out very well. So can't yeah. argue with success, can you? You know, I mean, for us, we actually went through exactly didn't, the... But to be truthful, I, I was not convinced this radiographically didn't look like renal cell to me, but obviously that shows you how little this I know. This is hepatic, Oh, yeah, this is a, okay, this is... This is a hepatocellulose. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a very unusual um, yeah, well, I, location. What I know about a paracellular carcinoma metastatic in the spine, I've treated a few, but it's, um, but no, again, I, I, I think radio surgery is, is, is a straightforward tool to use. You know, in the setting of significant spinal cord compression, not, not radiographic compression, clinical compression, surgery is the only solution. Open surgical resection is the only solution, if there is a solution. Now, uh, it's good to hear. Claudia, do you think we were too aggressive here? <laughs> so, okay, yes, no, yeah. so I think I would, again, uh, it's a high risk operation. Uh, mechanically, uh, he has more than 50% of the vertebral body. I think that I totally agree with the pedicle screw instrumentation. I totally agree with facetectomy, like getting the nerve root and getting all the tumor that is in front. But this is what I like to follow the Bielski school. So I, I would uh, stop probably when the bone becomes hard. I would stop in there get out, probably you could save three, four hours, or maybe, I don't know, in my hands, at least three hours. If you have to take the disc, do carpentry to put a cage, remove the rib, that takes more time, more blood loss. And uh, in terms of local control, you're really not adding a lot more because you can cover with serotactic radiosurgery after the patient heals. 
And uh, the, the literature is showing that surgery to decompress the cord, followed by serotactic radio surgery, you have a one-year local control of more than 90%. So I don't think what you did is wrong, but it's just another way to skin the cat. Thinking on doing a more economic surgery yeah. is not unreasonable. Truths again, the principles uh, we uh, all abided by, so we had pathology actually in the room. We did the embolization first because vascularity is a huge deal. We used that time to also get his coagulation uh, reinflated. You gained everything by embolization because had he continued to bleed when you did the laminate, you could have stopped. Absolutely. You could have bailed. Yeah. So and that was the thing. We had a very limited exposure. Yeah. Uh, we took our time exposing it. It was a bipolar dissection. It uh, worked like a charm. We then went to step B. We basically did the laminectomy of the tumor resection. We resected that as, it's not on block, but we basically went through the muscles and shelled it out in a muscle cuff and uh, resected the, uh, lifted it up, resected the root, uh, and then lifted up uh, most of the lesion. Uh, he still did not bleed badly, so we put the screws in and then went for the whole thing. So he actually lost, I don't know what it was, 300 cc's or so, and he was very grateful. This is a, a very proud man, so he wanted to keep his legs, and we were just delighted. I think it took him about two weeks, but we took the foley out, and he had his own. So this was I would a, like to make another point, though. So, I mean... Who did the angiography? Was it a neurosurgeon? It or? was a neurosurgeon. Well, see, that's, you know, in the vast majority of the hospitals in which you're going to find yourself, you're not going to have a support service like that, and you're actually going to be better off you personally sticking a needle in it and trying to, you and the local pathologist, you can even look at it yourself under H&E &E and maybe do a better job of diagnosing a lymphoma or, you know, figuring out what this case is before you blunder into some disaster. So, yeah. So. It's a very insightful question. Yes, we were blessed with a gifted uh, neurosurgical team that uh, knew the spinal artery anatomy and uh, did everything just perfectly. If you're at a VA hospital, it could take two days to get that angiogram done. Not all, but yeah. So basically, uh, coming to a conclusion there, uh, spine tumor care, I think it's a real chance to connect with our patients. This, uh, I think the single biggest thing that I have learned over time is trying to sit down with them after the initial shock and realization a lot of patience is over, the disappointment is over, and then asking them several times. The renal cells, the lady that I showed before, was a very simple case because we had time on our side. We sat down easily four or five times with her, went through the pros and cons of just doing nothing, um, trying more radiation, uh, sending her to Stanford for stereotactic radiation um, versus uh, doing a uh, in situ peel out versus the best possible bet, which is on block resection. So uh, basically in summary, uh, as a um, spinal oncologist, we're asked to basically be a knowledgeable scientist, a skilled surgeon, a visionary artist, as I hopefully demonstrated, an insightful counselor, and a wise sage, and we should enjoy it. And this is uh, being a great doctor. Thank you.